Hello and welcome. My name is Raj Basord and I'm a consultant psychiatrist based in private practice in Harley Street, London. And I'm here at, um, in Birmingham at the Royal College of Psychiatrists Annual Congress and I'm delighted to be joined now by Professor Steve Peters. He's author of possibly, I think, the best-selling um, motivational um, development book uh, of the last year, 2014, entitled The Chimp Paradox. He does so many things that it's actually difficult to describe um, his various affiliations, but he is uh, perhaps best known as the creator of the chimp model. So, Professor Steve Peters, could you just t- tell us a bit about all the... Thank you for inviting me. Um, I wrote The Chimp Paradox uh, under some pressure at the time from the medical students at Sheffield, where I originated the model probably around 20 years ago it began. And it was an attempt to try and explain the neuroscience of the brain and make it simple in an accessible way to the public. It wasn't meant to be an academic exercise. Um, When we look at research, we seem to indicate now that many parts of the brain act independently of us and appear to have even thinking processes outside of our control. Uh, and even agendas. So what I developed was the idea that there are two thinking brains, analysing thinking, and a backup system that I called a computer. And the students loved this, and I used it in clinical practice, and many of my patients loved it. I used it particularly with alcohol disorders, and that was a lot of good rewards from that. So what is uh, the chimp paradox, and what is the chimp model? It's a simple way of accessing the brain by saying that you're the human in the brain and these are the circuits that you control where you say things like I'm going to stay calm, I'm going to enjoy life, I've got these certain values, I've got this mindset. The things that you actually agree with and want. Um, the, the chimp has got its own agendas and they may be very different to us, they may agree with us. So the simplest example I usually give is, is about eating because that's one most of us can relate to. Where if I asked a typical individual, how do you want to be eating today? They would answer something like uh, the right kind of food, the right amount, um, and none of the junk food, or maybe a tiny bit. Um, But actually, by the end of the day, most people haven't done that. And so if you start to say, why haven't you done that, and you look to the neuroscience, you would see by using functional scanners that the brain is effectively being hijacked by this inner chimp this brain that's separate from us and has its own agenda of it's going to have immediate pleasure, it's instant gratification, and it doesn't respect uh, consequence, therefore it doesn't think ahead. So, And and lots and lots of experiments have sort of shown this by some amazing research, things by psychologists, psychiatrists, uh, so we're, we're getting a better picture that actually we have this divided self within the head, um, but we do have a backup system as well. And that's why I said the computer system is really important. These are the memory banks, but they're also active memories, so they give us behaviours and thinking which are generated spontaneously. So your view is that it's important to understand the chimp within us, but having understood it, um, what do we then do about that? Are we able to control it or override it? I think this is a question I asked way back in the late 90s, is if you've got somebody who is um, finding that their emotions and emotional thinking are dominating and hijacking them, is it possible by gaining emotional skills, um, move the blood supply in the brain effectively and move the oxygen uptake into circuits that are more rational and working on facts and truth? And my experience clinically was it is possible and it's a skill. So we can learn to actually go into a different mode of thinking um, by understanding that the brain allows this. So that's where it came from. But I didn't want it to get so complex that people couldn't use it. So I wanted it to be entertaining, yet serious, and said, look, recognise the circuits. So there's you that tries to run the brain in the way you want to. There's the chimp that tries to run the brain the way it wants to. And then there's a the computer system which ultimately actually runs most of our life. So could you give us a practical example um, of how you've used the chimp model? I mean, perhaps you're most famous for working uh, with um, athletes, elite athletes competing in the Olympics, and perhaps the, the British cycling team may be an example. But could you give us a practical example of how you've used the let, chimp let model? Let me give it a generic example and make it very simple. Uh, if an athlete goes up to compete in an Olympic uh, final, say, um, you'd expect the natural process that the athlete would experience a lot of anxiety, a lot of apprehension, Um, possibly an inability to focus, um, depending on the athlete. Um, And what the athlete would say to me is, why am I getting so anxious? Why is things so out of perspective? It's only a sporting competition. I'm all prepared, I'm ready, and I actually want to do this, and yet have these nerves which are stopping me. And it may make them do emotional things during competition, like choke or make poor judgments. 
And what my job was within sport was to say, right, this is basically a hydrant from the chimp. Let's see if we can move this oxygen supply and get the uptake more in the frontal areas of the brain and then hand over eventually to the computer where we get process-driven areas. Um, and I did this with a number of sports people and they got the hang of this. So what you're effectively doing is dealing with the chimp, managing it in, in a way unique to that person, though there are general ways of doing it, and then get the human being to take control of the situation and then hand that over to the computer and learn how to warm the computer up and go into computer mode. And my experience has been that when people do this, they're far more accurate in what they're doing in sport. They're able to focus, the anxiety levels disappear, um, they're much more opportunistic in the way they approach sport rather than uh, fearing um, and apprehension. So you've just been talking at this event, the title of which was Leadership, Management and Engagement, Unlocking Quality Care for All, here at... Uh, the annual congress of the Royal College of Psychiatrists. And I noticed you were talking a bit about, it's important to understand what we can control and what we can't control. Yes. And that we often live in a target-based culture where people are hand targets to us. Um, is that related to the chimp model that you've been talking about? It is, because I think what the chimp brain tends to do is it gives unrealistic expectations of what it can do. Um, and it, hasn't, it doesn't work with the reality this part of the brain just works with what it wants to see as reality. Therefore, you expect in this mode to get into a lot of areas of frustration, uh, possibly anger, uh, annoyance. Uh, I don't think these are wrong. I'm just saying they're not helpful. They're natural but unhelpful. And if we go into human mode, we work with reality, what is. So we work with what's in front of us rather than what we want to see in front of us. So these are sort of simple examples. I think the key point for me, though, is that uh, I was very apprehensive about writing the book because... When I work with people, they're very much unique individuals. So the person and myself sit at the same side of the table and we discuss what it is they're trying to do, how they're managing, what, are, what is their particular mind like, because all of us are unique. So what I didn't want was it to become a recipe uh, or a formula because I, I personally don't feel that I can offer that. Um, other people might be able to. I can't do that. The way I work is to work with the person as a team and say, let's look at how you're managing, what you want to do and what outcomes you want. Make sure they're realistic and then see what you're capable of doing. How would you say that your model differs from previous models in psychology or neuroscience? For example, as a, a lot of what I'm hearing sounds a little bit like cognitive behavioural therapy or the older rational emotive therapy, about the notion, for example, that you have choice, more choice than you may be aware of, and more control that, than you may be aware of, and also questioning what are people's real goals. Um, and, and what are, you mentioned in the talk I've just been to, intended, you mentioned what are people's values, their yes. value system. I think if you look across, and obviously I've, t I've taught this for a long time, and you teach all the therapies, so you look at transaction analysis and Freud and the post-Freudians and, and obviously CBT, cognitive behavioural therapy, you start, you get principles within each of these. So principles of rational emotive therapy and then the succeeding uh, CBT are that we can have irrational thoughts and we need to recognise them and alter them. That's a principle and that's seen in many therapies. Um, the, what Freud did was genius I mean he brought in the idea of the unconscious and, and people argue yes or no does it exist but the principle was there that there are elements of our brain that run without us being aware of it and what I was doing is looking at all these principles but for me what was missing in the current therapies and I'm not saying that they're, they're wrong I'm not saying that I'm saying it's you choose the therapy that you resonate with so it's very important the person picks what they think this works for me um, for me, what was missing when I was doing the clinical work is that there were people condemning themselves for not being able to manage their eating, not being able to manage their thinking, not being able to understand their emotions. And um, I was saying, well, none of these therapies up now have said, well, this is an independent part of the brain, and actually you can't control this. This is going to run its course, and it is more powerful than you. Hence, it will sabotage what we're trying to do with our lives. And I felt that I wanted to bring in because I was having to deal with a lot of people who were beating themselves up, had such low self-esteem, poor confidence, and I felt by dissociating this brain away from them and saying, look, you need to recognise this actively thinks and has an agenda and a way of working, which is very different to you, uh, they can then distinguish between the two and stop taking responsibility for the nature of that brain. So this was a new approach and... It appeared to work clinically, so I pushed on with it. It would need um, validating, um, which I'm hoping to do. Um, but again, I would be saying to people, if it works for you, great. If you resonate with it, if it doesn't, 
and throw it out with the rubbish, but work on something, because all of us in this field are doing the same thing. We're trying to say, let's get quality life and get the best out of you. So that's why I brought this model out. I added, I suppose, a dimension that there was another living part of our brain which was given to us genetically at birth and, and has learnt it and interpreted life in its own way, which is quite independent from us, but clearly in interaction with it. When people come to you or organisations come to you with goals, let's say there's a weight loss goal or a fitness goal or the goal of getting a gold medal in the Olympics, um, organisation has a goal, um, what do you see as kind of the biggest errors they, they seem to be making? I think this, again, is only what I do, so I'm not saying this is right. I'm saying this is the way I've worked and, and it's worked for me and, and most of the people I've worked with is distinguish between what I call a dream and a goal. So a, a gold medal is a dream. It's something you really want to happen. I don't want people to lose their dreams. Um, but the, the goal actually is what you can do in order to make that happen or the probability of it happening. So your training program, you can do certain training and control that. So I look at goals as things you can control and dreams are things you can't control, but we hold on to them. And the same even with weight. I'd be saying, you know, don't look at weight as something that you're going to aim as a target, as a, a goal. Rather see it as a dream. Uh, so hold on to your dream, but then say, what is it that's going to get me to that way? What are the things I can do and what are the things I, I'm not to do in order to get the best probability of getting my dream weight? So in other words, it feels like you're changing people's focus away from dreams to what they can actually control, because that's the, where the serious action occurs. Yes, because again, if you look at the way the brain functions, uh, the chimp dreams a lot. Uh, the problem is it muddles them up with goals, so it will start to muddle up the idea that I can get a gold medal with reality, which there isn't that reality. The reality is it's a throw of the dice, and it always will be. Um, and I think most things in life are probability driven, they're not guarantees. So all you can ever do in life is do what the process is that will give you the best chance of achieving your dream. So again, I'm saying that the, the chimp tends to go for dreams as goals and that leads us to potential feelings of failure or distress. Whereas human beings say, as long as I've done my best, I'm an adult, I'll deal with the consequence if I don't make my dream. So you shift people's focus onto the actual process, yes. um, and then what happens then in terms of analysing the process? Because usually they'd have got the wrong process, I would, I would imagine. You work with them. I mean, it's not for me to tell people what works best for them. What I would do instead is I'd be saying, um, let's try out what you think will work. Obviously, I would guide them. If I've got experience where I say, well, actually, most people don't find that helpful, or most people do, and I'll suggest. But at the end of the day, together we work on a plan of action that they agree with, they want to own. I, I like ownership, and the ownership goes with the person. I, I'm just there as the minion. I'm just a facilitator. Uh, they're the leader of the campaign. Um, my job is to be almost like the spin doctor and give advice if I can and say, right, what about this? And then what happens is we audit that, as you do with any process, and they would come back and say, this is working for me or this is not working. Uh, and then we look again and, and I would be expected to come up with some ideas uh, and encouragement to, to keep them going forward and maybe change the way we operate. So, it, as I said earlier, it's a team between two of us. What do you see as the biggest errors that modern-day psychiatry or psychology are making in treatment? Because you, you, you work, worked as a psychiatrist. Yes. So um, you obviously, I think, came to your model because you thought something wasn't quite right with, with what was being done in terms of treatment for... I think every, uh, each therapist has got to do what works for them. Uh, and we know that the therapist themselves has a major input into the outcomes, you know, and their relationship with the patient. We've always known this. Um, so it's, it, the therapeutic relationship is critical. So I, I wouldn't like to say that there were errors. I'd say there are differences. Um, I'd take, for example, um, one of the, the biggest problems I found when I was a psychiatrist in clinical work was working with young girls who had eating disorders. And this is horrendous uh, difficulty. Um, and I tried very hard to get them away from this idea that they were actually the problem in their approach or in what they were doing because my firm belief is they're being hijacked completely because when I've chatted with the girls they get distressed and some of the lads as well they get distressed and say this is not what I want or who I want to be which is clearly, clearly telling me under my model this is a complete annihilation by the chimp and this is where entertainment as it might be becomes quite serious because this is devastating effects and actually working through that to say right what is nature doing here which is quite natural, um, you know, I wouldn't argue it's grossly pathological, it's very unhelpful and it leads to pathology, but I think it's almost within normal limits, you know, because so many people experience problems with eating. So I think it's just, you know, we don't manage our chimps well. 
Um, but I would then say, let's find out who you are and what you want, uh, rather than dealing with what I call the treacle and going straight to the problem and then having battles. Because at the end of the day, the, the person who's suffering from this disorder, I hope, joins forces with me and we start managing the chimp together. So it seems that one of the big things that you do is produce more self-acceptance, I think. Yes. Um, but there are people who have really quite serious goal conflict. They say they want one goal, let's say a low weight, yes. or to be healthy, and yet they're doing something else in pursuing another goal, and they're not being honest with themselves about the goal conflict that they have, and that's a key problem. I think that can be, but my experience has been that when you sit down with someone and you get them into what I call human mode, uh, and they're relaxed enough to open up, then they'll share that with you, and most people will, will know what the problem is, and they know what's happening, but these are drives uh, that are taking them into places they don't want to go, and their beliefs underpinning that. So you're getting a mixture of dynamic therapies, behavioural, cognitive, the whole lot comes in. And I'd like to address it all, which is why I just give little simple terms to the chimp, the gremlins, you know, the computer, it, just so we've got handle to work with so that they understand there are multiple uh, approaches with this. It's not just one thing that's going wrong. You're using a language like the idea of the chimp within yeah. all of us that I think people find really easy to access and understand. Again, how much of, of what we see in modern-day psychiatry is that there's a problem over language? The language of neuroscience and 5-HT2A receptors and so on is something that people find very difficult to work with. Again, I mean, I think there's a place for that, and, and, and quite a few patients or the members of the public who are struggling um, with their own emotions or thinking would like an academic basis. It, it was just I chose not to go down that route because I've worked with a spectrum of age groups, and as I said in the talk, my youngest student was three, uh, and I feel that you've got to have a level where people can access it easily. I think if it gets too complex, which is why I stopped inventing more to the model, because otherwise you end up with a cult or it becomes so difficult you have to follow the language. Whereas I think when I first started introducing the chimp, uh, the medical student said, I can see this straight away. That's exactly what I look like, and it's what I feel like when I act in this mode. But actually, there's a lot of depth to the model, because obviously you start to understand how subtle the chimp can be in the way it thinks. And sometimes I call it emotional thinking rather than emotion, because it isn't a case of logic and emotion. I mean, the human has emotion, the chimp has some rationality to it. So, But I'm trying to keep black and white, because otherwise we just get into academic arguments, and that doesn't help anybody. So I, I've gone down a simple route. As I say, if, if people aren't keen on it, then throw it out with the rubbish. But if somebody says, no, this works for me, then that's great. And it, it's quite humbling that it's worked for quite a lot of people and, and brought rewards for them. The other thing I was very impressed with hearing your talk just now is how quickly you might say to someone, is my sense, I, I could be wrong here, let's say an elite athlete, that actually they may not get the gold medal, that, that, yes. that, that they, they may not... That their, their expectations of themselves may be excessive given their skills. You seem to be able to say that up front quite quickly, I think. Yeah, I do. I mean, because that's the truth. And I think the same. Let's take it just to Joe Public, and I'll do it to myself and say, could I be, with emotional skills, I'm supposed to be the guru of this model, so therefore <laughs> my chimp shouldn't come out. But will he come out? The answer is probably. You know, but I'm not going to get upset because that is the way it is. And, and it's a skill. I keep saying it's an acquired skill to do this kind of work. And so some days I won't get it right. You know, no matter how much I try, I won't get it right. I'll get wrong-footed. But there's no point in me then getting really upset about this because that's not very really helpful. Of course I'll try and learn from it. And I'm saying to, to Joe Public when they come in, you know, stop being so harsh on yourself because none of us get life right completely. And, you know, you've got to learn to smile about that, you know, when it's not too dire. Uh, and just say, you know, we all make mistakes. All you can do is go back to the drawing board and say, right, I need to learn a bit better on acquired skill of emotional control, emotional management, whatever you want to call it. Before you came up with the chimp paradox and the chimp model, what do you think was the closest to it uh, in, in the field? I think that's a difficult question because I've looked at the principles and I, there are a lot of behavioural things. I mean, the gremlins represent cognitive behavioural therapy, um, but uh, as I said in the talk, my difficulty when I got that was patients would come back and say, well, I still have these thoughts. And I'd say, yeah, but that's actually not the computer now. That is spontaneous from the chimp, and it will always do this to you. You know, it doesn't really learn, so you can do this for 30 years, and still these thoughts come. And I'm saying, but don't worry, that's normal and natural. What we're going to do is learn how to manage that. So effectively, that then becomes much more dynamically driven. So I think there are elements of um, 
transaction analysis, elements of cognitive behavioural therapy, pure behavioural therapy, social therapies, because what I did is looked at the principles of each, because all of them are really good and valid, uh, and then merged them into what I thought was a more comprehensive model, but added in this independent factor of, please recognise some of this isn't you. So the current dominant model in psychiatry and psychology in the NHS in terms of psychological approaches is a CBT model, which is not something you entirely embrace. So where would you say are the key differences between your model and the classic CBT model? I think it was that notion that even with CBT, which is brilliant as a therapy, and I'm not down that at all, uh, it was the when people work with that, when they came back to me saying, why am I still getting these negative thoughts? It isn't stopping, and why is my self-esteem still so low? And I'm saying, well, you know, genetically that seems sensible that, you know, this primitive part of our brain, which is not quite so primitive, uh, that we share with with the great apes, it does have this capacity to make us lose confidence because that's necessary for survival. Therefore, if you lose confidence or become apprehensive, that's really healthy and natural, but it just is unhelpful in certain circumstances. So all I'm saying is that. Um, I, I'm not disapproving of any of the therapies. I keep advocating it. If whatever works for you, go with what works for you because once it resonates, you'll get some quality of life. All I did was bring on the idea that, you know, please recognise some of your thinking and behaviours do not come from you. So don't be responsible for them. Just be responsible for managing them. But don't have a guilt trip. Steve Peters, author of The Chimp Paradox and creator of The Chimp Model, thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much. <laughs>